Now we get into what happens with acute disconnectedness or disruptions in co-regulation. This is the world we're in. Now look at the upper part of the face of these two individuals. Look at what those eyes, the muscles around the eyes, the orbicularis oculi, is conveying to you. Disinterest, not a part of social activity. And you know, they could even be texting each other. <laughs> now, in our society, what have we done? We said technology is good, especially technology developed by those who are on spectrum. Because uh, what we see is there's more movement to technology and less movement or opportunities for face-to-face -face interactions. And I want you to consider face-to-face -face interactions, which includes play, face-to-face -face play, as neural exercises. And what you're seeing in this picture are school systems that are very proud to move the interaction to an object and from a person. And you see, look at the upper part of the face of this child. But as you look at that face, look to the upper right-hand corner of the slide. What are the teachers doing? They're co-regulating with each other. <laughs> Just to share with you where relationships are going. And there is a web page that has all kinds of facts on it. And, it, and when you go to that web page, it says that 25% of I guess it's individuals from about 17 to 25, are have, when they have sex, they're texting while having sex. And that's why I have the slide down as lost opportunities, because it's not enabling the human sexuality to support the bonding of the relationship. They're shifting neurophysiological states that interfere with those processes. So disrupted co-regulation. Uh, what happens when we disconnect face-to-face -face behaviors? Does that trigger biobehavioral states of defense? So trauma and abuse can disrupt co-regulation and connectedness, and that's really the audience to whom I'm talking to because you see this in your practice. So when we look at this picture, we can articulate objectively that a young man is giving his girl a flower, or we can implicitly respond to the picture and tell what we really feel. We feel that that young lady is dissociating, not present, and we don't see a warm smile on the gentleman's face. So we see features like this in individuals who have been abused, who have trauma histories, and we become very concerned. So the issue is the upper part of the face is conveying lots of information regarding the biobehavioral state of the individual. And we have a caring mother trying to reconcile or console her daughter. And we see the eye movements, and the eyes are going to the side, which is an attempt to disappear, which is a start of a dissociative response, to become inanimate, to become part of how reptiles uh, defend themselves. And here we see a similar. If you look at her face, she is attempting not to be there. And again, we see couples who can be in close proximity without the capacity to co-regulate each other. I love this one because I'm sure this is the perfect picture for a group, a couples therapy uh, advertisement with a before and after. I don't have the after, though. <laughs> so this is a picture of an orphanage in Russia. Now, it's a remarkable picture because there are lots of children in the picture. Lots of objects, lots of toys, no common eye gaze. None of them are looking at the same thing, which we call shared attention, and none of them are looking at each other. So there's no capacity, or appears to be a capacity, to co-regulate. And I'm sure many of you are dealing with adoptees from Eastern Europe who come into this country with this type of history. Now, we need to juxtapose that to typically developing children, and we see that even though they're not looking at each other, they have a common point of attention, and you see this even while playing soccer. And it's remarkable when you look at this versus the first picture that I showed. So trauma is a chronic disruption of connectedness. The body doesn't feel safe with another, and when it does that, it means that the physiological state has shifted. I want to give you another concept at the, this moment, and that is uh, the concept of physiological state as an intervening variable. 
This is what's coming between the context, the stimuli in which we live, and our responses. Our physiological state distorts or changes the reality of our life. So that when we are highly mobilized, our body biases the, our interpretation of facial expressions to the negative. It's an adaptive response. When we feel safe, the negative may become neutral to us or less imposing. So we bias our interpretation of other people's faces based upon our own physiological state. So the intervening variable is our physiological state. Trauma disrupts our physiological state, distorts our social awareness, displaces social engagement behaviors with defensive reactions, including fight, flight, and immobilization. And we'll actually start emphasizing this more as the talk goes on. Because when I entered this whole area decades ago, people only talked about one form of defense. They talked about fight, flight, and being associated with the sympathetic nervous system and arousal. No one conceptualized or was able to talk about immobilization, death feigning, as a defense system that recruited an autonomic system, which was vagal, because they were in love with the vagus as promoting health growth and restoration, and didn't have a conceptualization that there were two vagal pathways, one which can shut you down, and one which enables you to feel safe. They're two different pathways. So one, vagus is not always good. It depends upon where in the brainstem the pathways come from. It depends on what part of the brain is being stimulated. So our trauma interferes with the healthful reciprocal co-regulation of state. 